Today's episode of the podcast is brought to you by Eccentric, the makers of the K-Box and the new K-Pulley. Guys, flywheel training's really grown in popularity of late, and although it's something that's been around for a while, the simple reason that it's grown in popularity is because it works. We've been lucky to have a K-Box in our weight room for the past three years, and we've seen some really great things when it comes to improving the athlete's ability to change direction, and then looking at our return to play protocols with different lower body injuries with the student athletes. The love-hate relationship that everyone has with the K-Box is now just going to grow more with the addition of the K-Pulley. The ability to do standing presses, pulls, rip-throughs, and knee drive exercises is just going to be another arsenal to our training and another addition to the love-hate relationship that our student-athletes have with the awesome tools that come from Eccentric. Go ahead and hop over to Eccentric.com today to check out what they have. Guys, I can't recommend it enough, and I guarantee you won't be disappointed not just with the products, but with the awesome customer service that Eccentric provides. Hey, everybody. If you enjoy the podcast and the content that it provides, make sure you hop over and check out the all-new Strength Coach Network. The Strength Coach Network is the combination of the CVA SPS community and the Rugby Strength Coach community, bringing you what is sure to be the Internet's leading resource for continuing education for strength and conditioning professionals. Combining these two resources has allowed us to bring some of the best content from some of the best minds in the world together for your one-stop shop to better improve the continuing education for not just yourself, but your entire staff. Bringing together all of the lectures from the Rugby Strength Coach community, along with the lectures exclusively done for the Central Virginia Sport Performance community, and all the lectures performed at the Central Virginia Sport Performance Seminar, make this an absolute must for performance coaches around the world. The world-class lectures at the Strength Coach Network are not all that you'll see as well. The discussion in the forums and the support and the career guidance from some of the top practitioners in the world, from people all over the world, makes this an absolute must and a great place for you to network, learn, and grow as a performance professional. So hop on over to strengthcoachnetwork.com and use the code CVASPS, that's C-V-A-S-P-S, to get your 48-hour trial for only a dollar. We're sure you're going to find great value in the Strength Coach Network and are really excited to have you involved. So hop on over to strengthcoachnetwork.com and use the code CVASPS to check it out today. Hello and welcome to the podcast. Today, guys, we have an absolutely sensational discussion with Donskov Strength and Conditioning's Anthony Donskov. Guys, we're going to sit down and we're going to get right into Anthony sharing with us what he's looking at with his PhD and, you know, the background to it and why he feels that this is important to him as a coach and a practitioner uh, to really dive down this rabbit hole of force plates and, and uh, return, to pro, uh, return to play protocol, excuse me. And we then get into, you know, how he looks at KPIs and, and, and you know, that impact on not just return to play, but also how he trains all the athletes that he gets the opportunity to work with. And that leads us right into programming, guys. We dive right into how he looks at you know new clients, uh, young training age clients, and his advanced level athletes, and where are some similarities and differences in what they do. Um, and then Anthony gets into this really awesome story that truly encompasses his view of being a successful coach uh, from, from a time that he got the opportunity to spend with Team Canada. And then, guys, we finish off talking about his tissue remodeling block. You know, we've seen a lot of that on social media. And it's, uh, it's really interesting to hear, you know, its role in training and how he builds it, where it came from, and, and how it leads into everything else that they do up there in Columbus, Ohio. This is really an awesome talk, guys. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. Let's get right to it. Anthony, thank you so much for spending the time with us today. Hey, Jay. Thanks for having me. It's a, a privilege uh, to be speaking with you today. I'm a huge fan of your podcast and the information you put out for all of us strength coaches. So thanks very much for having me. Well, appreciate the kind words, brother. But let's uh, let's give everybody a quick little catch up about what you got going on uh, up there in Columbus. Sure. Well, um, run a strength and conditioning facility in Columbus, Ohio. Just a little bit about me. I'll keep it short and sweet like my hairline. I know your listeners can't see me, but I'm bald. Um, I was born and raised in Canada, uh, born in Burlington, Ontario, raised in London, Ontario, moved to the States in Columbus, Ohio when I was 13 years old. So went back and forth and played hockey um, and had the opportunity to attend and play hockey at Miami of Ohio. 
Believe it or not, Jay, my undergrad uh, degree was in business. Uh, looking back, I wouldn't change that. I'm proud of that. Uh, something I use every day. I had the opportunity to play a few years of minor professional hockey uh, after Miami and then uh, immediately knew that uh, my passion was actually, uh, while I was playing, preparing for the game. So uh, I started a small business, literally in the backseat of uh, my car, (laughs) as an in-home strength and conditioning coach. It uh, slowly evolved and grew to about a 600-square-foot facility. At that time, I went back to school and pursued a master's degree in exercise science Right now, our, our facility, Don Scott Strength and uh, Conditioning, is located in Columbus. We have about a 3,000 square foot footprint. Um, and in terms and measures of my education, I'm pursuing uh, my PhD in kinesiology at University of Western Ontario in London, Ontario, Canada. So where I grew up. So that's a, a footnote version about me. Yes, and I think that that's an awesome rabbit hole to kind of start to run down. Is to kind of let's start with what you're studying what's driving these ideas where, and where the ideas are coming from and so we can work our way back into some of the training talk we had going earlier. Yeah, sure. I just, I'm passionately curious. I, I, I've stated before that the, the, the coaches that I admire the most aren't the most certain. Um, um, they're the most curious. So for me, it's just trying to, to face some weaknesses that I have. I feel like I can be a better scientist, a better coach, um, and there's no better, better way, in my opinion, to do it than test that on an educational platform uh, and couple that with a pragmatic background in your craft. Uh, my passion has been hockey. Uh, it's probably, Jay, guilt by association. I mean, I was, I, I was born in Canada, played my whole life. Uh, really, the niche in our business in Columbus uh, is hockey players. So um, what I would like to do, I just passed my candidacy exam, so I have a lot of runway still to travel for my PhD, but what I'd really like to do is explore return to play uh, for lower body injuries in ice hockey um, and be able to, to uh, um, better objectify that with the use of uh, technology and, and specifically uh, dual force plates. So this is a, a huge learning experience for me. We don't have that kind of technology at our facility, so uh, that's where I'd eventually like to steer this, this PhD. Yeah, you know, we were talking a bit about that because I think that a lot of these things with return to play, we we do miss the boat on where people are prior versus where they are post. Sure. Yeah, you and I spoke about it briefly. I mean, I I, I get it. First and foremost, let me me say that everybody, uh, I think it's important to really respect the context because everybody works in a different environment. So it's easy to sit up here as a, as a, as a pundit or critic and say, we should do this, we should do that. The reality is it's not that simple. And we have to respect everybody's uh, context. For me, I run our own facility, so I can do it and say and, 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 and run tests as I please. That's not, uh, uh, you know, not everyone has a liberty to do that. But what I was talking about was, you know, uh, when players report to camp, to be able to have tests that can both, uh, you know, do one of two things. Number one, uh, provide better narrative to the coaching staff, you know, where the player's at, but also be used as baseline numbers if or when a player gets injured, right? So, you know, if you're a general manager and, and you've got a $3 million a year player um, and halfway through the season uh, they come down with a knee injury and you're bit better able to objectify that return to play status, I think that's probably more important information than his bench press numbers. And again, not to say one's bad and one's good, but the idea here is, and again, I'm sure a lot of my colleagues and friends are doing this in the National Hockey League. There's some really, really bright people out there. But this is how I want to steer that PhD, meaning let's take that data, use it as baseline. If someone gets injured, uh, be able to uh, assess and and give uh, uh, general managers and and decision makers uh, better better information on their players. Yeah, and then looking at that, that piggybacks right into training and looking at KPIs and how you evaluate players. So you're in a, in a facility where you primarily work with ice hockey players. So let, let's talk about that. Let's talk about how Anthony trains the kids. Let's talk about your onboarding process and, and what you're looking at with these young athletes all the way up to the pro guys that you get to see. Sure. Well, let, let me start. But again, this is a conversation we had off air, but I think it's important to bring up. I feel strongly about it. And I think it's important. You know, I think 99 percent of this stuff that we see on social media and uh, articles written, et cetera, are for elite level population. Right. Including me. I mean, I fall guilty, but I'll point the thumb. A lot of the stuff that you see on our social media regarding tissue remodeling blocks, uh, three day rollover programs, gain, go and grow. And we can get into that a little bit more really is for our advanced level athletes that have high training ages. 
I think uh, for the most part, a good program for young athletes, uh, progressive overload and linear periodization will work wonders. So uh, our programs for our young athletes are really training the athlete, not the sport. We want to teach them to move better. Um, we want to teach them to progressively load that weight, drive more force into the ground and become better athletes. Um, for advanced athletes, it's a little bit different, but I think simple programs, Jay, can work for advanced athletes as well, but for different reasons, right? So for young athletes, they need more time under tension. For advanced athletes, in order for them to get good at their sport, they have to play their sport. That comes at a physiological cost, right? If you want to be good at playing the guitar, you don't tell someone don't play the guitar all summer. You got to play the guitar to get better at it. So simple programs can work for advanced level athletes as well because they need to spend more time focusing on the requisite skills for their sport, i.e. ice touches, skill work. And in my opinion, less time uh, grinding and grunting in the gym. That doesn't mean what we do is not important. That's not what I'm saying. I'm just saying simple programs can work, in my opinion, for advanced level athletes for those reasons. So when an athlete comes in for us, uh, an advanced level athlete, uh, we take them through an assessment. Um, and it's a combination of subjective and objective information. Uh, the first thing, if we haven't uh, worked with these athletes before, it's casual conversation. And, and um, you know, what's worked for you in the past? What have you found has really helped you in the off season? What do you enjoy doing the most? Um, I think it's really important when you work with uh, advanced level athletes that it's a cooperative approach. Uh, a good friend and colleague of mine, Nelson Ayo for the Blue Jackets, says that uh, coaching is a lot like parenting. You know, a directive approach might be warranted at a younger age, but for the older athletes, it's got to be cooperative or you'll lose them. So I want our advanced level athletes and our pros to know that their DNA is on their program. That's important for me. Um, from there, uh, we'll go over, uh, you know, injury profile, position. Um, I will get information uh, if they're uh, able to provide that for me with their strength and conditioning coach because I'd like to reach out to he or she. I think it's important that you open dialogue and uh, you get feedback. This is what the athlete needs to work on. Here were his KPIs that we've addressed over the season. There's no ego. Like I want to know what that athlete's worked on and, and what those weaknesses are so that potentially I can address those in the summer. Um, from there, we go over uh, – a movement assessment. We'll do a couple of PRI tests. Uh, the AD doctor drop test for us is the big one to see where their pelvis is in terms and measures of its, you know, are, are they uh, anteriorly rotate? Are they not? Um, we'll do a uh, just a basic FMS assessment to see how they move dynamically under load. We, we will start this year as well on doing a Y balance um, just so we're a little bit more uh, objective and we'll be the lower body portion of the Y balance. So we'll get an idea of ankle dorsiflexion, Postural lateral and postal medial, which I think are important for hockey players because they essentially live in that position. We will get a separate measurement uh, of ankle dorsiflexion, um, and then um, we will uh, or, or we won't do any performance testing that day, Jay. But just for the simple fact that most pro guys are coming in after long hard seasons, right? I'd rather get that information from their strength coaches. More importantly, though, Jay, I'd rather build that into their programming so it's not it's not piece it's not a it's not, um, what's the word I'm looking for? It's not uh, sporadic testing. It's a piecemeal approach where the monitoring is part of their program. Does that make sense? Yeah, totally. I mean, because if you're looking at it as a, a KPI or something that is going to drive training, then putting it in training just makes it drive training because it's training. Exactly. And, and I'll, I'll share with you what we track for our guys. It's no, like every time they come in, we'll get some internal metrics um, and uh, we'll get, uh, um, you know, we call pre-workout stress, which is a modified work. How do you feel? One, I feel a million bucks. Five, I feel terrible. Uh, they'll also, before they leave, fill out an RPE. One, it wasn't hard at all. Five, it was very difficult. Um, every professional athlete or, or, or advanced level athlete will get a heart rate monitor and we'll track training load and training intensity. How we do that for load is just um, um, track duration uh, multiplied by average heart rate. And then for uh, uh, intensity, we'll, we'll, uh, we will uh, take uh, training duration and multiply it by RPE and we'll track those. For us, uh, you know, we train them in short durations, 12 to 16 weeks. So it's not like we can see a plethora of data over the training process, but for us, we wanna see, okay, is that hard workout at the end of the week really a hard workout? Are they recovered? Um, and each player uh, will get a, a player profile. So, you know, we'll have conversations with those players throughout the summer. So, for example, after phase is one, phase one is done, we'll look at their KPIs and go over those. And we'll be able to see phase by phase how they trend. 
Um, and if their strength and conditioning staff needs to see um, how that athlete performed, we're able to send them a, a you know, one-page PDF profile of, of those KPIs over time. Um, we'll also, um, our external metrics, uh, we have gym aware, so we, we do a lot of, we load a lot on based on speed, it's particularly our, our go day, our speed day. So we track that, we track our counter movement, squat jumps. Um, we are uh, keen on tracking body composition, so that'll be tracked every every block as well. And then a 10 meter sprint, we have uh, Brower timing systems, and we'll track that throughout the course of the summer. And again, that's part of their program, so there's no separate testing days for that. And again, we'll be able to have conversations after each training block with those athletes and, on how they're trending, making sure the needle's hopefully pouring the right way. And if not, and, it, and that happens too, Jay, right? You have to air eliminate as coaches. Another problem emerges. We have conversation with the coaching staff, the athlete, and we, uh, we uh, experiment in a different way. So the, the reality is it doesn't always work <laughs> perfect, right? Our programs, are, I'm, I'm fond of saying, are temporary hypotheses. And the goal is not to defend them. The goal is to try to find problems with them. And you can't find problems if you don't measure things. Yes. You can't find problems if you don't measure things. And I think that when we're talking about subjective and or objective measures, understanding what the greatest at, the, at what we do have seen um, sometimes leads to us being able to understand really what's important. And you gave a great story before we got on here. And I think that this needs to be said to people because I think that this is something that has been completely, because everything's cool on social media and, and like we can all come up with neat hashtags and show one minute videos of something that's absolutely sensational. I think that this story that, that you shared with me before, I think is important for coaches to hear, not just because of the story, but because what it actually means to you as a coach. Yeah. The story that I'll share with you was, is pretty cool. Actually, we, we talked about it off air, but uh, so my older brother, uh, Misha um, right now works for Las Vegas, the national hockey league. But before uh, his uh, duties with Vegas. He worked uh, at Hockey Canada as the director of analytics. Um, and the year was, I believe, 2016. Now, don't quote me on that, but he was working for Hockey Canada and they were playing in the World Cup, which was a massive tournament with all the best NHL stars on each team. And uh, uh, he called me about three weeks before the game. They were going to play an exhibition game in Columbus, Ohio, so where I live. Uh, and he said, Anthony, you won't believe it, but uh, we are going to host uh, Hockey Canada coaching. Uh, and I said, host? What do you mean? He said, well, we're, we're going we're gonna to cater a meal in mom and dad's backyard. So I live in Columbus, Ohio. My mom and dad live about five miles from me, less than that, in about a three-acre backyard. And I said, so let me get this straight. We're, we're going to have the Hockey Canada coaching staff over at mom and dad's. He said, that's correct. So we got a picture of this. I'm a huge hockey nut. I love hockey. That's been my, my lifeblood at uh, uh, growing up in Canada. So I get here, the, the, this place is fully catered and a big old bus pulls up and stops at the end of my parents' driveway. And you'll hear the old sound of the bus stop and the doors open. I'm sitting there with a beer in my hand and uh, on walks one by one, literally uh, Hockey Hall of Fame Central, you know, Mike Babcock, Joel Quenville, Barry Trotz, Ken Holland, uh, Rob Blake, uh, uh, just GMs, Doug Armstrong, like it was just a who's who. It was a, probably a, a moment I'll never forget uh, the rest of my life. It was unbelievable. And uh, literally, I, I, I'm sitting there having a cigar with, uh, with, with Joel Quenville. It was the coolest thing ever. And uh, it was a small uh, little uh, group. And I, I asked questions because I'm a really curious person. I had the opportunity to ask some questions to Babcock, Mr. Uh, Coach Babcock, super intense individual. And I asked him, I said, who's the best player you ever coached? Without batting an eye at the time, he had mentioned a player. And I won't mention him here on air. But I thought, wow, interesting. My next question was why. And his response literally is still stained in my brain as a coach. He said he embraced the monotony of being a pro. And I thought, wow, he embraced the monotony of being a pro. And I thought, you know, the best coaches also embrace the monotony of being a coach. Like how many, we talked about this uh, off the year, Jay, like how many squats have you seen? How many squats have I, how many hinges have you taught? Like you have to have a passion. You have to embrace that monotony because 
if you don't have that down, the 1% that you see on social media doesn't really matter, right? I mean, those are the basics. That's the foundation. Um, think of how many pregames that hockey player has been to. Think of how many workouts he – think of how many times he taped his stick the right way. Think of how many airline t- – like everything. He embraced that, and that allowed him – to expand his career and be the best he could. I think there's an inherent monotony in being a good athlete. I also think there's an inherent monotony of being a good coach. Um, and we, uh, it's not all about the the, the the 1% you see on social media. Uh, I was telling you, I like to post stuff about our professional athletes and the methods that we use. And the, but the reality is a lion's share of good strength and conditioning, in my opinion, is simplicity. And simplicity is the ultimate sophistication. Yes. Now, the guy that you did mention off air, you could argue, is one of the three best defensemen in the history of the National Hockey League. Hey, and that brings me to another point, too. And this is something I have to remind myself, my friend, of often. You know what? Uh, I, I always point the thumb when I say this. You don't win the Kentucky Derby with a jackass. My good friend, Kurt, uh, you know, you have to have the horses. You're only as good as a team getting off the bus. My good friend, Fergus Connolly, is fond of saying, you want a good uh, college, you want to be a good college strength and conditioning coach? Have that coach recruit the right players. You want to be a good professional strength and conditioning coach? Have that GM buy the right players. That makes everything look easier. <laughs> you know, I always I always say this to myself every time, no matter what athlete leaves and has a great year in spite of or because of. The reality is some of the best athletes in the world could be elite athletes on subpar programs, maybe even arguing below par programs. Um, so we could talk about this for a long time, but I always remind myself of that in spite of or because of. Check your ego at the door, Anthony. You know, check your ego at the door. Yeah, no, I'm with you there. And it's it's funny because I actually had a pretty good conversation with Fergus about some stuff today. But it was uh, when we're looking at that, like embracing the monotony of being a good coach. Like, you know, it, it's funny. Carl's name comes up almost every other episode on here. And it's I, I, lo- I love his quote where he's just like, man, boring works. Yeah. Like. Yeah. If you can't handle it, like, if you can't understand that, like, doing things over and over and over is what gets you better at them, then I don't know what to tell you. I agree. And let me add to this, though, too. Boring works, but it's our job. This is what I believe strongly, too, Jay. There's a difference between facilitating and coaching. Like, boring works, but you better be passionate enough. You better explain to your athletes whether there's a room full of 12 year olds or a room full of pros, why they're doing what they're doing. Like facilitating is just watching it transpire. Coaching is saying, look guys, here's what I want. Here's the foot position I want. Here's why it's important. Here's why it carries over to your game. I know this is monotony. I know at times this can be boring, but here's why it's important. Um, I also believe this with all my heart, the older I get, you know, if you asked me 10 years ago, like, hey, what's the, what's the, what's the secret sauce? It's the programs. It's the pro, you know what it is? It's the people, it's the trust that you gain with your athletes. And it's a perception of your program. I don't care if you call it placebo or not. Many times the perception of a program is more important than the program itself. Um, I've had great colleagues, esteemed colleagues of mine saying, you know, a poor program coach well, many times is better than a great program coach poorly. It is our job as coaches to let the athletes know why that monotony is important. It's our job to periodize confidence and it's our job to make that athlete believe in what it is we're selling. And I don't like to use that word selling because it comes across many times as a negative, but it's not. We all do that every day. Um, So the older I get, I think the perception of the program may be more important than the program itself. Yeah, and then that runs us full circle back into how you were talking about how your program evolves with yep. the more they, the, the more experience they have, the more skin they have in the game. Yep, yep, yeah. I mean, uh, for, our, for our pro guys, I mean, to give you an idea of, of um, I think that's what you're alluding to, kind of how the setup for, is for our pro guys. Is that right, Jay? Yeah, so the, typically how it works for our pro guys and again, uh, we go through this on their onboarding session after they get their orthopedic objectives and their dynamic assessments, et cetera, is really frequency. And, and like I said, some of our guys, a lot of our pro guys like to stay on the ice for large portions of the summer, not to condition at the onset, but for skill work. And I used to think five, 10 years ago, get off the ice, get off the ice. I don't feel that way anymore. Again, I'm not championing year round hockey. That's not what I'm saying here. 
But I'm also not naive to the fact that these guys have to refine their skills. They do that with skills coaches. Uh, we're going to have an on ice portion ourselves at the gym this year um, where we're going to be on the ice working skill work, not conditioning work. So to me, something has to give. And for us, for our pro guys, uh, frequency, um, again, this is dependent on the individual. But what we started to do and we really like is we see our pros three times a week as opposed to four days a week, like a tipper, typical upper body, lower body push. The program in itself, Jay, would be more considered um, uh, what in the track world might be a three day rollover or a uh, undulating periodization model. So it's a complementary model. So we're trying to uh, complement the the uh, off ice or the conditioning work with the lifting. So Monday, we call it our gain, go and grow. So our gain grow is our max effort method. We'll complement that with acceleration. Um, our Wednesday will be our go day, which is lifting sub-maximal things very fast. So our dynamic effort method. Uh, we will also complement that with our speed work where we time our athletes that day. So remember I talked to you about our, our, um, our metrics being built into our program. And then the last week specifically designed for this is our grow. That day of the week really sucks. We will do things, uh, work capacity days, repeat effort method days. We'll do things like escalating density, reverse pyramids. We'll do things um, – where we're really pushing to uh, to increase the capacity of the engine. And we'll pair that at the onset before work with either change of direction or as the season off-season progresses, more lactic tolerance, lactic power type stuff. So um, we're hitting uh, a lot of – we're complementing the energy system work with the lifting – and that micro cycle, with the exception of our tissue remodeling block, and let me say this too, I've posted a lot on the tissue remodeling block, and I want to make sure I give credit to where it's due. That's in large part to UJ disseminating information from a good friend of mine, Jim Snyder, and his information has been very, very valuable for us. I know what's uh, in the new book, the volume three book, and I, I strongly encourage listeners to get that. And I can't speak highly enough on how it's changed our program. But with the exception of our tissue remodeling block, that micro dictates our summer. Now, we will change reps, exercise, stance, bar position, et cetera. Uh, but to us, that micro dictates our macro. Um, I think in an experiment, the less working variables you have, the more you know what works and what doesn't, right? So for us, we want to be consistent with our loading. We want to be consistent with the stress that we place. And when I say consistent with the stress we place, the biomotor abilities that we're working on, again, we're going to change the rep counts, et cetera. But that's a micro and that will, will carry itself out until athletes pretty much leave for training camp. Uh, the big thing that changes is the energy system work on the last day. It'll change from change of direction to more lactic work. Does that make sense? Yeah, totally. And I love that because I think that all too often people are now looking at some of these corrective remodeling blocks as what they're going to be like the actual building block for everything where actually – you're taking a step back and using it for what people have talked about, and that is to get them to be able to have the dexterity and ranges of motion to hit, and then you're going to build the capacities in which to work on. I think that's brilliant. And I think, too, with that tissue remodeling block, it's important, too. Like, you, you don't just do it to do it. Understand that the, the – I think I, I stole this from Patrick Ward, so I think I need to give him credit for it. But when I think of designing programs, I think adaptation first, method second, and then exercise. So what is the adaptation I'm trying to solicit first? And then what method am I going to use? And last but not least, uh, what exercise? So for tissue remodeling, you have to think about the chronic postures of sport. And they're different for each sport. Hockey's in this crouched position. Your prime movers are your monoarticular glute. Um, and uh, uh, at the very end, the last 200 milliseconds or so of extension, your quads, right? Hamstrings are important too because they preload the quad. Um, but what that does to the pelvis, what that does to the tissue, right? And you're also kind of rounded over in that hockey stride. So I've, I've made posts on this before. What are we trying to do? We're trying to restore length tension in the system. Sarcomere, uh, actin and myosin cross-bridging efficiency. And we do that by a short, long approach. We're going to focus on isometrics for long duration in a shortened position that are uh, inhibited during the course of the season, like the distal portions, for example, of the hamstrings. And then the long approach on those muscles that are over facilitated, like the hip flexors. Uh, and this, again, is the idea that I, I got from Jim. And, and we've added our own kind of flair to it. I've stolen some exercises from Dr. Serrano here in Columbus. I've, I've stolen some exercises from Jim, who I, I'll definitely give credit for. But I think that's another take home is don't just, you know, copy and paste, for lack of a better word. Understand what you're trying to get. Uh, adaptation first. 
method and then exercise, I think is an important concept. Yeah, because again, like, you know, of course the mundane and, and most of the things that we do are going to be very similar, but your guys are your guys, my guys are my guys. And just because it works there doesn't mean it's going to work here and vice versa. Absolutely. Absolutely. So Anthony, let me, let me get you out of here on this, man. You've talked a couple times about, you know, posting things and putting things out, which you're doing like some awesome stuff with and like those, those, those one minute wisdoms. Is that what it's called? And then the, yeah. you know, the, yeah. the graphs and the diagrams of everything, where can people find out more of what you're doing and keep up with you? Sure. Um, uh, we have a Twitter account on our gym, uh, just at Donskov, D-O-N-S-K-O-V-S-C. Um, and Twitter is the exact same thing, Donskov, S-C. We also have Facebook, but uh, not uh, uh, not as heavily populated. as We don't use it as much as those other two platforms. So that's probably the best way to get a hold of me. Awesome, brother. I truly appreciate the time, man. This is sensational. Thank you so much. Thanks for your time. Really appreciate it. Yeah, man. We'll be in touch really soon. Okay. And a huge thanks to Anthony Donskov for spending the time with us today. Guys, open, honest, candid sharing. A man sitting here sharing exactly what he's doing, where he got it from, you know, the stories that he's had along the way that have impacted him as a coach to bring him to where he is. I can't thank Anthony enough for spending the time and being so open, honest, and candid with us today. And on top of that, guys, he's putting out some sensational content. I know that he's saying that it's, a, you know, the 1% of what he's doing. But make sure you get over there and give him a follow because he really is pushing everybody forward and, and with all the stuff he's sharing. So, Anthony, keep up the great work, brother. It's, it's truly appreciated. And as always, guys, if you did enjoy the talk, please share it through the social media outlet of your choice, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, whatever it may be. We are just trying to get the best information out there to all the great coaches that we can. And as always, guys, thank you for everything that you do for us here at Central Virginia Sport Performance. We will be back next week with another awesome guest. We will see you then.